Welcome to Adventures with a Very Small Lathe. The challenge has been issued and I'm nearly late to the party. Way back in January, Rustinox challenged YouTubers to make a co-hanger for their workshop and videos started rolling in. I was so busy working on the Chinese lathe I almost missed it, but with a few days until the end of April deadline I'm hoping I can still make it. I started out with this piece of 316 marine stainless I had left over from another project. At this point I had no real plan and hadn't even decided what length to work with, so I fed the whole piece of stock through the spindle bore. 316 isn't well suited to machining. It work hardens very easily, but fortunately it burnishes to a lovely finish with insert tooling. I thought I'd try using a round radius insert tool to shape the rod into something I could hang a coat on. A wide groove with curved edges should be able to hold the hanging loop of a coat even when it's mounted horizontally. As the tool is round, it cuts equally well in both directions, which should help ensure a similar surface finish at both ends. A quick stop to check how it's looking. The finish is fine, but it's not nearly deep enough yet. If 316 is rubbed too much during machining, it can work harden so much that ordinary tooling can no longer cut it, so it's best to make sure the tool doesn't remain at either end for longer than necessary. The insert still rubbed enough to build up quite a bit of heat. I only filed the corner very lightly, as I want the corner to look clean and square to the eye, though it obviously mustn't be sharp. A rubberized abrasive stick is a really easy way to take a decent machine finish and turn it into a very consistent, semi-polished finish very quickly. That'll do for the hook part of the hanger. I left a bit more length beyond the groove and cut it off with the bandsaw. This material is a nightmare to part off on the Proxon lathe. The lathe doesn't have nearly enough torque at low speeds and at fast speeds the rubbing hardens the work, generates lots of heat and feels like a catastrophe waiting to happen. While I had the bandsaw out, I cut a slice from a much larger piece of 303 stainless to make a backplate for the co-hanger. <laughs> 303 is a different grade of stainless steel. It's less well suited to marine use than 316 as it's less corrosion resistant, but it's specifically formulated with sulphur to make it easier to machine. Easier machining will be quite important as this is a very large diameter with a small proxon lathe. One of the problems I have with this bandsaw is it doesn't work with lubricant. If the blade gets oily, or too hot, or chips build up inside the housing, it throws the blade off. Like that. Fortunately it's not too hard to fix. Just remove this cover. Detention and remove the blade. 
brush out the tips, wrangle the blade back onto the wheels, set the tension, and screw the plate back on. Let's see if adjusting this blade guide will help. Looks like a finish with no more issues. Back at the lathe, I've decided I want to mount the hook onto its back plate using a screw, so I'm going to drill and tap the rough end. As the outside surface is already polished and going to be on display, I'm going to use copper soft jaws to avoid marking it. I spotted it with a centre drill, but there's no need to go any further. If the high-speed steel drill is moving too slowly, the work hardening material will ruin the grind on the twist drill, and it will go nowhere, so it's important to apply steady pressure on the tailstock wheel. It's equally important to listen to the sound and stop regularly to check the temperature and add more cutting oil. There's a distinct change to the sound a twist drill makes when it starts to get loaded up with chips or is starting to warm up. Wait for the sound change to be too obvious though and it's already too late. The hole is drilled to 5mm for an M6 thread. I used a sprung tap follower in the tailstock to keep the tap straight while I started the thread. Three one six is a very difficult material to tap. It requires a lot of force and the chips can be very hard and sharp. Failing to clear the chips can cause a lot of damage to the thread. After a few turns the part starts to slip in the soft jaws and it quickly became obvious that no matter how tight they were, the soft jaws offered too little friction, so I removed them. If there's any damage to the outer finish, I'll just have to repolish it. After a few more turns I reached a point where it was slipping again, so I switched to a different technique I've used with difficult threads before. I used a bottoming tap without a tapered grind to open up the threads I've already cut, then once that tap had cut as far as it could I changed back to the starter tap to start forming some new threads further down the hole.
Between each tap I used an air nozzle to clear the chips and added fresh cutting oil. To completely tap the hole I had to switch back and forth between the two taps many times, but that makes very boring video. Fortunately I had two tap wrenches the right size, which made things a lot more streamlined. I hadn't faced the end before, because tapping raises a large burr. Now the tapping is complete, I can face the end, having saved myself from doing it twice. A lathe file removed the sharp burr, and the Kratex stick polished up the last bit of the length. The hook part of the hanger is now done, but in order to turn the base plate I need to switch to the other set of jaws. Three hundred three stainless is a much easier material to machine than three hundred six, but the much larger size of this part creates other problems. Extending the tool from the holder enough to reach the centre of the part will make it very flexible and likely to chatter. Instead, I shift the tool in the holder to sit at an angle so it can reach across the full diameter without the tool crashing or interfering. This is a very large part for a small lathe, and the first few passes across the sawn face were interrupted, so I ran the lathe quite a bit slower. The cutting force so far from the centre causes enough resistance to load the motor and slow the lathe down even more. Once the surface is entirely cleaned up, I set the lathe to a more normal speed for carbide inserts to the finishing pass. For the front face I wanted a decent sized chamfer on the corner, but I'm limited in how much engagement with the cutter the lathe can handle before the chatter builds up.
The Kratex stick made this front face look fantastic. The back face was almost exactly the same as the front, except I didn't chamfer it, so it'll sit cleanly against whatever surface I mounted on. In the centre I needed a hole for the screw attaching the hook to the base plate. A 6mm hole is usually enough clearance around a stock M6 screw. Just like the previous hole, I kept a steady pressure on the drill to keep it cutting consistently. I planned to use a countersink head screw to attach the hook, so I drilled a countersink into the back of the plate so the head was completely hidden. Drilling this involved a lot of engagement between the cutter and the part, so I took it fairly cautiously, taking particularly care to try and prevent too much rubbing. On first check, the countersunk head sticks out a bit from the face, which will prevent the plate from sitting flush, so it needs to be a little deeper. There's quite a big burr left around the countersink, so that needs to be removed. Using a regular lathe tool seems like the easiest way. The lathe work is now all done. The remaining work is to drill mounting screw holes in the plate, and I did all of this on the mill. I use the Proxon dividing head as it's compact and a really easy way to drill holes with radial symmetry. The main advantage is that the lathe truck fits directly onto the dividing head axis, so I can get pretty good concentricity without any complicated setup. I'd get really good concentricity if I could move the truck from the lathe to the dividing head without rechucking, but this part is large enough to block the chuck mounting screw, so that doesn't work.
The first drill I set up is the spotting drill, which marks a hole's position and makes a detent which allows the twist drill to start easily and reliably in the same position. This spotting drill is drowned to 120 degrees to match my twist drills. The twist drill is a coated high speed steel bit ground with a split web. This means it should have no trouble even in stainless steel without a pilot. Drilling worked best if there was a good consistent pressure applied, too little pressure and it started to rub and squeal. I didn't even need to count the number of clicks when rotating the chuck as I just needed to move it to the point where the three jaws are back with the same alignment. This is an advantage of drilling three radially symmetric holes with a three jaw chuck. The detents made by the spotting drill seemed to work pretty well, I couldn't see any sign of the drill trying to wander. Finally I added a countersink to each hole for a nice flush look with countersink mounting screws. I switched to a drill truck for this final operation as the 6mm collet wasn't able to grip the countersink drill firmly enough. This is a problem with the 6mm collet that came with the Proxon mill. It seems to be slightly oversized and the collet clamping nut bottoms out before it can get a really solid grip. This part is now finished so I can screw the two parts together. And now it's ready to mount on the workshop door. I drilled pilot holes for the three screws. Then I ran a steel screw into each hole to open them up to an easy but snug fit. I then mounted the plate using polished brass screws. Opening up the hole first made sure I didn't damage or over the softer brass screws, though I did slip up and damage one of the heads slightly. Thanks Rustinox for setting this fun challenge. If you enjoyed this video, check out some of the other challenge responses in the playlist, which should be on your screen now.